Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I appear to have been promoted from CEO to chair of STM, but never mind. Um, uh, a welcome to ARPA 2016. It's my pleasure to chair the opening session and to provide you with some uh, opening remarks. Um, when Arno was telling me about, uh, oh, sorry, wrong place. <coughs> yes, when Arno was telling me about this conference, he was talking about how we would have a great deal to discuss. And of course, we are having both the perfect storm and in this context, an ARPA storm. Um, we're still dealing with the consequences of digitization. This is affecting business models, open access and the novel licensing uh, solutions. It's pushing into issues around copyright revision. Uh, many of us, certainly in the publishing world, will be aware of the European Union copyright revisions, but this is not restricted just here in Europe. It's going on all over the world, and there's a series of debates about exceptions and limitations going on at the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva. And of course, we have the internet zeitgeist as uh, online publishing and uh, online delivery in not just our sector but in every other sector advances some of the nostrums that uh, were thought of as originally rather west coast have invaded the uh, zeitgeist if you like the that sense of uh, of spirit that we all have in the media industry um, and we're also seeing obviously the re results of digitization in the practice of science with the growth of e-science and the the growth of work using large data but we cannot be unaware of the continuing consequences of the 2008 financial crash. Um, we're seeing austerity in European and other public budgets. And those of you who were listening to the news this morning will have heard about the reduction in the Chinese growth rate to a staggering 6.9%, uh, 6 but which is uh, woe and lamentation in China since they're used to something a great deal higher than that. And we also have a whole series of unintended consequences of laws that were agreed and had good intention, but have resulted in some unexpected outcomes. One of these is the Darmstadt case, uh, where uh, the right to digitize uh, products in libraries, paper products in libraries, and the right to make public have collided with uh, print books that are in fact also available as digital editions being circulated by people who've digitized them and then loaded them up on the web separately. Um, this, is, this is going on uh, here in Germany as we speak. And we have the recent decision by the European Court of Justice on the Hewlett-Packard case, which was against copyright levies. This is for secondary rights uh, management. And this is causing considerable concern because the German RRO, Fargovort, is thinking it might have to reclaim monies that it paid for the last three years. Uh, and this, of course, would be uh, very problematic. But as uh, is apparent throughout this program, we're still in the celebration year of 350 years of the learned journal. And uh, this was an idea that we can actually trace in history as having actually been invented in 1665. But a rather simpler approach to this, a simple newsletter, had already been anticipated by Robert Hooke. Um, and you can read the quote there as well as I can. And he obviously had this idea, but like many things that Hook did, he didn't follow it through. Um, so it actually was left to someone else to, to bring forward the first um, periodical that we would recognize as a journal, although it's not a journal in the modern sense at all. And this was the French journal, Journal des Scavins, which appeared in January of 1665. Um, it's not a journal in the modern sense because it's essentially a journalistic production. It wasn't containing articles written by researchers. It was actually done by um, uh, essentially journalists, or they were called scriveners back then. The real first person to really take this by the scruff of the neck and to turn it into something that we now recognize was Henry Oldenburg. Um, Henry Oldenburg uh, was a German, uh, but he lived in London, where he was a diplomat originally. And he became the first joint secretary to the Royal Society without any salary, it might be added, in 1663. And in 1664, considering he had all these different papers he was trying to deal with and circulate, he considered trying to make money through a printed newsletter. But he didn't do it at that time. And it was actually the following year that he created the world's first scientific journal, which was celebrated at various events during uh, this year. And Oldenburg was its editor and publisher, 
and he actually published it at his own, for his own profit and at his own expense, and it's rather interesting that in his letters he comments that he never actually made enough money from it. The functions that he created for this journal are really important because they're not about technology, they're not about creating a newsletter, they're not about collecting stuff together, they're actually about rhetoric and reputation. They're about how uh, authors seek to be uh, rewarded for what they've discovered by no the knowledge of that discovery being apparent amongst their peers, about where they publish, about having a permanent record of what they've done. And all of these which were present in 1665 are present in every primary journal that we see today. Obviously things have changed a little bit. We've added, uh, because of the amount of material out there, there's about 28,000 journals publishing uh, at the moment uh, in, in science, and these obviously need to be navigated. So we've created another thing where we have to find what we're looking for. But nonetheless, the principles of these four functions actually underlie the whole of the scholarly, formal scholarly communication world that we inhabit. Uh, we can see these actually in terms of the physical structure of the documents in front of us. Here's an example by a certain Mr. Newton writing about having seen colours in, in optical glasses. And the key thing about this is that the four functions that Oldenburg identified are identified here straight away. And you can see them. I've boxed them in colour. But we can see exactly the same thing 200 years later in a paper published in Nature which was the one that gave uh, the discoverers of Buckminster Fullery in their Nobel Prize. And we can even see it in a, in a thing from PLOS One that I've downloaded a couple of years ago, um, uh, showing exactly the same structural components are present. And of course, the question we should ask ourselves is not why has so much changed, but also why has so much stayed the same, and will it continue to do so? This gives us a whole series, this historical, very brief canter, I think, through our world gives us a number of issues which I think are going to be addressed in this opening panel. One of them is what more can we do to innovate science with digital possibilities? And does this new approach mean we get rid of the journal article or do we keep it but radically alter it? And in a business context, how does this perfect storm I talked about earlier and digitization affect business models? And, and not how does it, but how should it? And all of these are going to be addressed by our opening speakers. Um, and it's my very great pleasure to invite our first uh, keynote speaker, Professor Barrett Mons, to come and, and uh, give his paper. He is playing a key role during the Dutch presidency, which started at the beginning of this year of the European Union, um, advising Minister Decker, who spoke at this conference uh, last year. He's a professor at Rotterdam and Leiden Universities, and he's going to tell us this morning about the European Science Cloud.